All right, we are recording, rocking and rolling. Uh, welcome everyone. I know there's still people joining us. Uh, I see the number popping up. Um, want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Kevin Barney with uh, Mass Bay Youth Lacrosse League, uh, the director of sales and marketing. Been really, you know, excited isn't quite the word, but happy and and uh, to see what's happened this week as obviously everyone's lives have been kind of turned upside down. Um, this all started with a, a phone call about 10, 12 days ago to Trilogy Lacrosse after we had to cancel our in-person uh, coach education clinics and trying to say, hey, is there anything that we could do? And um, came up with, you know, why don't we look at doing some webinars and get, getting a platform like Zoom and uh, really, really quick, these guys put it together all week. We've, uh, every night we've had, um, you know, some of the best, uh, not only lacrosse players, but lacrosse teachers uh, with us from Trilogy. And then we also had several of our other partners jump on board, um, like Joe Nardella from the Face Off Factory, Marty Bowes, um, former MLL player, has been running the clinic every morning, um, a webinar. And we have tomorrow, uh, Pete Goalie is doing a goalie one. So it's it's been really cool to see all these guys step up and want to share their knowledge in, in this challenging time. And uh, with that, we're uh, really excited for tonight. Uh, joining us um, is Matt Strebel. Uh, you know, I, I said it last night that Ryan Boyle is one of the most decorated players in lacrosse. I'm pretty sure Matt and Ryan have compared those notes before to see who actually is, but won't put, put that too much on the spot. But Matt's an NCAA champion, a multi-time MLL champion, a world champion. So he's, he's uh, done it all but uh, is, is also just, a, as I said, a great teacher of the game. And he is going to be talking about the midfield play today, um, I believe a little bit on both the O and the D side uh, of midfield and, and how important that is. But uh, extremely honored to have him on and uh, take, a, take some time that we can all sit back and uh, talk a little across here for the next hour or so. So, again, if you have any questions during this, there's on the bottom of your screen, if you move your mouse around, there's a chat function and a Q&A. Feel free to put in any questions. We'll keep an eye on that during Matt's presentation. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Strebel. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, KB. Um, just a, just a few a few um, starting sort of logistical things here. Um, as I'm going along, I don't know how many of you have um, are repeat repeat viewers and have seen the stuff that Mitch and Ryan have done. Um, I'm less comfortable with the Zoom uh, platform than I am with PowerPoint. So I went a little bit heavier on the PowerPoint stuff. There's some animated stuff in here. Um, it, some of the animations move pretty quickly. Um, make sure that you get to that chat function and let KB know if you want me to rerun something, um, go through it again. I'm happy to do that. Um, as I say, whenever I do these, um, we do these live. It's, you know, I, I love doing these with Mass Bay. We've been doing them for, I don't even know how many years now. Um, and it's something that I look forward to every year, mostly, mostly because there is, you know, there is, in all of us who play lacrosse, there is a desire to sort of give back to the game and to spread the gospel and do what we can to make sure that the sport grows and expands. But for me, there's, there's also a sort of personal attachment to Massachusetts and to the MBYLL because I am from Massachusetts and um, I grew up in a super, super small town in the, in the western part of the state called Gill. And um, it's, it's, I, I feel it's always important to sort of introduce myself and, and share that because it, uh, it, it sort of lets you know that I'm somebody who came from nowhere in the lacrosse world. So my experience is that of somebody who was scraping and clawing to find places to play, was, you know, I had parents driving me constantly to practices in different places. And um, it's amazing to see what lacrosse has done in Massachusetts across the country as a whole, but especially in our, in our backyard here in Massachusetts. So I'm happy about that. Um, as, we, as we get going here, as I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reiterate this, ask questions, stop. I'm here to sort of provide information if there are things you wanna go over. Um, I'm happy to do that. I enjoy, um, as KB said, teaching the sport as much as I enjoyed um, playing it. So um, without further ado, let's get started. Now, um, I don't know how many of you guys have, have been following the, the sort of trilogy posts and the videos that we've been doing, but a couple of, a couple of days ago, Ryan and Mitch convinced me, they, they kind of, they kind of uh, snookered me into doing a uh, recap of the 1999 Syracuse-Princeton game uh, up in Syracuse, and it ended up being uh, an opportunity to laugh at uh, 
what I looked like as a lacrosse player in 1999. And it was, it was kind of funny watching that because I had this, I had this, this sort of experience of seeing myself as a sophomore in college and then having a much fresher memory of sort of the last few years that I played and seeing the sort of trajectory that I was able to make as a player from an attackman who, as Ryan would tell you, probably didn't have a great idea of what he was doing and sort of making it up as he went along to a midfielder. And um, I remember, you know, I, I tell this story often, but it bears repeating here. I was, uh, my, first, my first three years at Princeton, I was an attackman. And um, after Jesse Hubbard, Chris Massey, and John Hess graduated, I sort of slid into the quarterback role of the offense. I was playing X. Um, I was primarily a feeder. And I was happy in that role, relatively successful. Going into my senior year, I was a returning All-American, a captain. And we had a, a precocious freshman attackman who was in our program that year named Ryan Boyle. And it became pretty quickly apparent within the first, I think, probably game and a half that Ryan and I were not going to be able to sort of coexist as quarterbacks of the offense with both of us playing behind the cage. And um, I was brought into the office after uh, we beat Hopkins and coach Metz and coach T sat me down and he said, Hey, Streeves, you've had a great run. We're moving you to midfield. Now um, in the sort of trajectory of my, my lacrosse career up into that point, that was a pretty significant blow. Um, I was used to touching the ball in every possession, and here I was turning that job over to a freshman attackman. But after the 24 to 48 hours in which I was feeling sorry for myself, hating Ryan Boyle, and thinking I can't stand lacrosse anymore, um, I played my first game at midfield and realized, oh, wow, this is where I belonged all along. And it ended up being an ideal move for me. And um, I've spent all of my professional career, all of my international career playing as a midfielder. And I'm, I'm excited that, that the silver lining and the fact that we're having to do these webinars this way, one of the positives for me is the fact that we're actually able to specialize in the areas that we play. And so um, let's get started here. Um, all right. Gonna, gonna I wasn't going to tell that story, by the way. I, I, I oh, you know, yeah. no, know that very well. Ryan's told me that many times, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. So basically, we're going to get started here with what is a midfielder. We're going to define our, de define our terms. Now, um, I'm sure Ryan told you that attackmen are the most important guys on the field. Um, in my opinion, I'm also equally biased. I really think that any lacrosse team is only as good as its goaltending and it's midfielders. Because when you look at a midfielder, a midfielder does everything, right? And if you, if you just look at these sort of bullets here, midfielders are responsible. And now, not every single midfielder is responsible for every one of these aspects, but as a unit, right? And we're talking about a midfield unit, our responsibility is to create, to initiate offense, right? If you watch a college lacrosse game right now, there are very few teams that ever dodge poles long sticks, close defense, whatever you want to call them. It's typically let's isolate the short sticks, let's attack there, that's our best matchup. So middies become the primary generators of offense, right? And offense begins when one guy breaks somebody down and forces a slide. So as middies, okay, we're initiating offense, we're creating goal scoring chances for ourselves. We've also got to understand how to feed, how to move the ball, how an offense works in concert with the five other guys on the field. We've got to be able to shoot time and room. We've got to be able to shoot on the run. We have to be able to play and execute both sides of the transition coin, right? Attackmen just have to know offense. Defensemen typically just have to know defense, except for those few guys that like to go over the midline and occasionally run a fast break. But minis are the guys that have to have a really, really, you know, developed full field understanding of what's going on in a lacrosse game. Um, the one-on-one -on -one defense that middies play because, as we just said, right, middies are, are predominantly responsible for initiating offense. Therefore, the teams with the best D middies are typically the teams that are most successful. Every championship team I was on, whether it was in college or in the MLL or even with Team USA, our success was largely due to the fact that we had short sticks that could basically – take away their one-on-one -on -one matchup and prevent our defense from ever having to slide. And then um, you said, KB, you said Joe's already given a talk on face-offs, right? Awesome. Yeah. So you guys yeah. already, those of you who heard that one and everybody knows, right? Face-offs outside of goaltending, probably the single most important thing you have. All right. So what are the attributes we're looking for in a midfielder? Um, 
this is, you know, typically when you, when you look at, and, and I'm going to try to try to look at this from a youth lacrosse all the way up to sort of like an early high school level in terms of what we're talking about. And when you're talking about a midfielder, you're looking at the most athletic guys on the field typically. Um, attackmen can get away with being slow. I remember my first impression of Ryan. His first impression of me was, I have no idea where this guy's going and what he's doing. My first impression of Ryan Boyle was, how is this guy a Division One athlete? So we had these different sort of physical athletic things that we brought to the table. I quickly realized that Ryan's lacrosse IQ was off the charts, his general sports IQ was off the charts, and that there was a ton I could learn from him. But, you know, if we look at these sort of bullets of what a midfielder has, right, it's speed, it's quickness, it's explosion, it's stamina, toughness, intelligence. The one that I really want to sort of hone in on and, and sort of emphasize for you guys to take away from this is this idea of athleticism. And, you know, I think that there are a number of different ways that you can define athleticism. Uh, particularly with a midfielder or with a lacrosse player. And you can have somebody who runs a 4-4, somebody who can bench press however many pounds, jump over a Buick, whatever it is. There's also a kind of general sports athleticism and efficacy that I think is vital to being a midfielder. And, you know, if you think about, if I look at all the best midfielders that I played with, every single one of those guys played multiple sports through high school, was in a lot of cases thinking about playing multiple sports in college. And because of that, right, the midfield, if you think about the midfield as being the only full field position in lacrosse, you're taking stuff from hockey, you're taking stuff from soccer, from football, open field running, all these different sports, all those things go into making a kind of fully, fully in, in sort of shaped midfielder. And that's what we're looking for with these middies. We want guys who understand how to get away from defenders, understand how to find space, and those skills can be honed playing other sports. Okay, now I do this every time I do one of these, one of these uh, webinars or I guess coaches clinics when we're, when we're in person, I, I hit on these first few points. And these are some of the, some of the, the main things that I think of from a coaching standpoint. Um, number one, I always have a ton of cones with me. Um, just because I find that even with high school kids and college kids that I've coached, the more cones that I can put on the ground and tell them exactly where to go, the better chance that I'm actually going to have them going to the spaces they're supposed to go to. Um, the other thing is reps. Every drill that I've designed here is designed to maximize every opportunity we have, right? I, I like to say that every ball is an opportunity to get better. So what I want from every drill is reps, reps, reps. I don't like drills where there's a lot of standing around. I don't like drills where there's a lot of sort of involved things, steps going on that guys have to execute. I want very specific multi-skill drills that get tons and tons of, of opportunity to improve. Um, the other thing is, I always say this, whatever meager, financial backing you have for your club programs, whatever you have, resources, I would, I would advise invest them all in balls. The more balls that you can have at practice, the better. Uh, make sure you ball hunt, make sure you collect them. Um, I tell the story often, but with my high school team, um, we would run sprints for however many balls we were lacking at the end of practice. And you'd be amazed how many guys had receipts from Dick's Sporting Goods with bags of six packs of balls in their bags that would miraculously show up in our account when we were short. So balls are a huge, huge, got to have them. Um, and then the other thing is um, I love to keep it moving with drills. You get the sense, perhaps you've seen me in person or you can already get the sense now. I like to move things fast. I'm constantly on the move. I want my drills especially when we're talking about middies, to have this kind of pace, right? This kind of up-tempo vibe to them because as I said in the parentheticals here, that's hidden conditioning, right? Every drill that I can get where I have guys going, 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 going and taking as few breaks as possible, the better I'm getting them conditioned as athletes so that I don't have to spend as much time doing the extra sprints, whatever that is at the end of practice. Um, last here, um, simple, stupid, okay? So, so, as I said, I, I like drills that are, that are structurally and, and sort of executionally simple. I also love drills where in the first 15 minutes of practice, I can show up and I can have three stations set up where I have my close D, my middies, and my attack doing something individually where I don't even have to really interact with them on a consistent basis, 
right? We all know, and those of us who coach, the first 10 minutes of practice, nobody knows what's going on, where people are coming from, they're getting there late. Those first 10 minutes are kind of a wash. As a coach, I need about 10 minutes to settle into practice, to figure out what I want to accomplish, figure out how I'm gonna get myself engaged and motivated. If I have drills where these guys can just pick the ball up off the ground and do a shooting drill or do a, do a stick work drill, that's ideal. I can set them there for 10 minutes. I can move through each station, see who's working hard, and I can find those things out. Last but not least, shooting, right? Every drill that I, that I have here, um, with the exception of one or two, I think, can easily be turned into a shooting drill if it's not a shooting drill already. All right, so offense. So this is what we're trying to do here as a midfield, right? We're trying to beat our man and score. We're trying to draw a slide and move the ball. We're trying to create space for our teammates. We're trying to get open for shots, okay? As I said, this is basically everything you do as an offensive player, okay? So in order to do that, I'm gonna break this up into three parts. We're gonna have a stick work and shooting section, a sort of a really dedicated 1v1 dodging defense, portion and then a very brief transition segment at the end we all have a lot of great transition drills I just included one here that is my favorite that you can run purely with midfielders um, so let's let's dive into it here and again part one this is going to be all stick work and shooting and um, part two is going to be more of that one-on-one -on -one diving into those sort of individual matchups because more than any other position on the field I really think that that midfield is about at its core, it's about that one-on-one -on -one matchup, whether you are the guy who's trying to dodge or you're the guy who's trying to stop them. So part one, shooting and stick work drills. And again, so as we, as we go through these, I have these set up as animations. So it's gonna move quickly. Make sure you get on KB if you want me to run back and, and, and show you anything as we're going along. Okay, so this is a very basic drill. Most of you probably do a version of it already. Um, Bill McGlone, uh, All-American and midfielder play, uh, at Maryland, sorry, um, played professionally. He's, he does stuff with Trilogy. This is a drill that he does all the time as well. And as you can see, right, these big red kick balls, those are actually lacrosse balls. I have those uh, really brightly lit so you can see just how much I enjoy having tons of lacrosse balls at practice. Um, I do this drill with both attackmen and midi, basically all of my short sticks. I think that um, from an offensive standpoint, the more you can get your middies doing attack drills, the more you can get your attackmen doing midi drills, the better it is. And this is, this is purely a shooting on the run drill. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna click and run through it. And so what we're doing here is this is just splits and shots on the run over and over and over again, okay? And what we're looking for, if we go back to the beginning here, what I like to do is I would say it's in these animations, it's very difficult to get the guys to switch hands. So you've got to bear with me a little bit. I'll, uh, I'll explain sort of where we want hands. What I would suggest when you, when you run this drill, start the guys with their sticks to the inside of the field. Okay, so, so the guys on this side are gonna start with their hands the, on the left side. On this side, they're gonna be in the right. And what they're doing here is they're gonna be going simultaneously we're imagining this as a defender and we're gonna split at this first cone. And one of the things that, that I really emphasize at this cone, you watch the way a lot of young midfielders switch hands now. And I, I blame Will Manny for this because he's the best at doing this and he gets in really tight to his defender and he loves to drop his hands and kind of sling his stick beneath the, the defender's outstretched stick. Now, that's something that is great when you're Will Manny and you're one of the best attackmen playing the game right now. When you're a youth lacrosse player and you're learning how to play the sport, that's a bad habit to start with. And so I really try to emphasize when we switch hands, I want this stick coming straight across my chest. And I really emphasize punching that hand, right? So if I split right to left, I'm punching my left hand with that stick out away from my body as far as I can. I really try to exaggerate in this drill. So when these guys get to this cone, I have them punch that hand out, extend that arm one-handed, okay? I want these middies getting used to, to going to one hand because as you watch really high level, right? I was guarded by a pole most of my career. Paul Rabel, all these great midfielders, they're guarded by poles. So if you can train yourself to adapt to dealing with a pole, then dealing with a short stick is easy. So we're gonna slap that hand across, and when that hand is extended, what it allows us to do is essentially run away from that stick. Rather than 
punching our hand across, bringing the stick back, which is two steps. We're going to punch that hand across and then run. And by running, I'm running that stick into a shooting position so that with my next step, I can now shoot. Um, so again, this is very, very simple, but as soon as, so when we're trying to get reps, as soon as these guys hit this cone, the next two guys should be going. And again, right? Don't have the guys, don't have this be 25 people in a line. If you do this with four guys per cone, three guys per cone, they are going to be going continuously and they're going to be exhausted after about two to three minutes. Okay. All of the drills that I have can quickly be changed into a complimentary drill. So I like to, I, I have my middies do that shooting on the run drill where they're working just on a specific alley dodge move, north, south, speed dodge, right? Brief change of direction, brief change of speed. Now, with your middies dodging, what I always tell kids is you get two dodges, okay? You get your initial, your initial sort of stab, your initial take, and then you get one complimentary move. And so what this drill is designed, and I call this, this is five on a die shooting with splits and scrolls. And that's just a split and a roll back, okay? So we're gonna, it's, the execution is identical to the previous drill. I've just widened these two base cones. And the assumption here is that whoever was guarding me, they've managed to push me into this alley, okay? And they've kind of overplayed me and allowed me that opportunity to roll back to get more of a time and room shot, okay? So walking through this drill, right, we go down. And again, I can't have these guys switch hands, but what we're looking for here is a turn to the outside, okay? So if I dodge down with my left hand, with my left hand, I'm gonna end up planting and turning back and setting my feet and taking a time and room righty shot. So <clears throat> one of the things that often happens with young middies is they'll do this move They'll roll and then they'll run right back across the middle of the cage. And that's something we want to keep them, prevent them from doing because that's unrealistic, right? We want to make sure that these drills aren't happening in just a field in a vacuum that doesn't resemble an actual lacrosse game. And in an actual lacrosse game, if this guy just runs into the middle of the field, he's going to be at mass general in a coma. So actually, no, in the NBYL, you don't have any headshots. So he's not going to be, he's, he's going to be, he's going to be, on the sidelines being explained by his coach why he shouldn't run into the middle of the field and get the ball taken from him. So we want these guys to sort of set their feet, reestablish position, and then take this as a time and room shot. Okay, so this is gonna be a little bit difficult without being able to show this to you live. There are tons of great videos where you can see guys executing shots on the run. To me, this is a skill that players develop simply by doing it. It's very difficult to coach. There are little things that, that you can emphasize with certain players that can help. But to me, the biggest thing that you can do is just emphasize the fact that they should be running throughout this drill, right? They should be running throughout the shot. We want to eliminate that. And you guys have all seen it where the guy runs, runs like crazy right up to that initial cone, makes that split dodge. And then he goes pro hop, pro hop, shuffle step, shuffle step, time and room shot, and then starts running again. That's just a dodge into a time and room shot. We want to train guys to be able to shoot while they're still moving. We want them to be able to run through slides. We want them to be able to run through checks. One of the things that I always tell middies, the faster you run, the harder you're going to shoot because your upper body and your lower body are physiologically connected. If I'm pumping my arms, they can only go as fast as my legs are moving. So if I'm jogging and I'm then trying to generate power with my torso and my hands, it's not going to be there. So we've got to get guys sprinting, running three steps through that, that, that final shot and then continuing. And there are a lot of guys, right, there are different techniques. Some people say you end up, you end up facing where you came from. You can say that you start shooting when your outside foot is planted. Whatever technique you prefer, however you prefer to teach that just make sure that the guys are running and then the last thing I would say is just emphasize I'm not somebody who thinks that you should always shoot overhand right my career I evolved into somebody who became an outside shooter a time and room shooter and I shot plenty of shots sidearm there is a time when shooting sidearm is an excellent tool to have in your bag. When you're shooting on the run, it's not a time to shoot sidearm. Because if you think about it, right, if we imagine our goal as six by six, 
If I'm shooting sidearm, that means I have to hit the six feet side to side and up and down. If I shoot overhand and for whatever reason I get checked, my stick whips, whatever it is, I have all that ground that I can use for high bounce shots, for missed you know, errors in how I'm releasing the ball. And so I have more room for error. And whenever I'm dealing with kids shooting, my whole mentality is let's maximize our room for error. So one of the things that I like to teach guys, if I'm shooting righty, my left arm, forearm comes up to my chin. That means my butt end is gonna be pointing towards my target. And when I shoot, that butt end is going into my opposite pocket. So it becomes more, less of a twisting motion and more of a snapping over the top motion. Any questions on any of that? All right, good. <clears throat> so here's a, here is a stick work drill that can easily be changed into a shooting drill. And again, these drills that I'm giving you, one of the questions that I often get when I do coaches clinics, invariably one of the questions is, so I'm trying to run a one through two motion offense with my fifth graders. And I always say, yeah, good luck with that. It's never gonna happen, right? You're never gonna run any sort of, it's, it's difficult to run a one through two offense with a high school team, let alone a bunch of fifth graders. What you're trying to emphasize with younger players all the way up through potentially to middle school is try to get them thinking about different patterns, especially within like 3v3, two-man two man concepts. I know Ryan talked a little bit about two-man concepts last night, but what I try to do with my stick work drills is I try to create stick work drills that are mimicking positionally what I want guys to do in their position. So this, if you look at this, if you imagine this, right? And again, I, I count from behind the cage. So when I say one, three, two, I'm assuming one attack from behind, three across the middle here, and then two guys, two middies up top. So we're imagining, right? There's a midi, an invisible midi right here on the crease. KB, you can see my cursor, right? Okay. Um, so there's an invisible midi right here on the crease. We're taking him out of this for the time being, and we're just working on the top portion of this drill. Now, this drill, can, can, you can start this out with a simple turn to the outside, and that's typically where I start, right? We're gonna roll to the outside, protect our sticks from defensemen, and then you can, as you go along, if you do that for three minutes, you can then add in what I call, and I learned this from Greg Canella at UMass, he calls them pull passes, where we step back and I'm throwing just directly across my body rather than rolling to the outside. Whether I'm, whether I'm turning to the outside, rolling to the outside and switching hands, so in this case, this midi would be dodging down righty, switching hands, rolling away from pressure, and then throwing back up to this trail midi with his left hand, whether we're doing that or if we're dodging down right-handed and throwing, doing that pull pass where we dodge down, step back, and then throw directly across our body, we have to make sure that we're creating space. So as this drill grows along, we're dodging down, turning to the outside, we're throwing back, immediately throwing to the backside, and now we have that redodge opportunity. The ball goes back up top, and then this drill becomes continuous. Okay, so going back up to the top, if we look at this, okay, our assumption, right, we said our job as middies is to draw a slide. And what you can do here is as a coach, right, you could put defenders in here, you could stand in here at this cone, you could mimic slides, and what we're gonna then train, right, we can train really positive communication here. Rather than just talk, right, I always like to, to, to make a distinction between talk and communication. Any high school lacrosse player, any youth lacrosse player can talk. They can tell you about the last Marvel movie they saw. They can tell you what they're doing that weekend, what they had for dinner. When you actually ask them to communicate valuable information on a lacrosse field, you get crickets. So what we can train in this stick work drill is good communication. So what this, this second guy in line here, as the guy in front of him is dodging down, our communication, our call here is going to be double, 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 right? That's letting this guy know a slide is coming. He's being doubled. And now on the pass back, this backside midi, his communication isn't here, isn't I'm open, it's one more. And that tells the guy with the ball that the pass can come immediately to the backside, right? That information, when I say one more, that tells the guy receiving the pass immediately to just continue it moving the way it's going. So again, the second guy in line is gonna call double, 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 and then this guy's gonna call one more, and then he's in that backside redodging space, okay? Um, last, last sort of finer points here. 
on this transfer pass, okay, even if we're having this initial dodger turn to the outside and switch hands, this transfer pass has to happen as quickly as possible. So I allow, whether this guy's a righty or a lefty, play with your strong hand. We want to make sure that pass gets to the backside quickly and it's executed effectively. So if it's a lefty, we've got to make sure that he just opens up his hips so that that pass comes across his body. So he receives it across his body and is immediately able to bang it to the backside. So again, going through this drill, we get our double, double, double call. Now our backside guy is saying one more, one more. Now he's in the dodging opportunity. The guy behind him is calling double, 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 and then it's gonna go back, okay? It's an excellent drill. Remember what we said, let's make this a shooting drill, okay? So now we're dodging down the side, double, double, double. We get the throw back to the trailing midi. We get it to the backside. Now we're in that redodge shot situation, okay? So obviously if this is gonna be a, if this is gonna be a shooting drill, you wanna stack a ton of balls over here. And as, um, uh, as we're going along, we want to make sure that we, we shoot off both sides. So if we're initiating it with a righty dodge, we're finishing it with a lefty backside shot, we want to make sure that we do that for five minutes, then we switch it to the other side. You will notice as we're going along, I am constantly harping on the ability of middies to play both handed. Okay. Um, I, you know, there are any number of philosophies and, and people have different views on whether lacrosse players should play strong handed, one handed. My view is if you're Gary Gate, if you are a Canadian, if you're somebody who grew up playing box and you play Canadian style indoor box all the time and you're a lefty attackman and you are exceptional with one hand, beautiful. Go ahead, play one handed as much as you want. If you're an American kid who's playing field lacrosse predominantly and you see yourself as a midfielder, you have to be able to play both handed. When I think about sort of my personal lacrosse career, and it's funny, this is something I was thinking about watching that clip of me as a, as a semi-functional attackman in 1999. One of the things that I really, I grew up in Boston as a fan of Larry Bird. And one of the things I loved about Larry Bird was every year Larry Bird came back with something new added to his game. And my mentality as an athlete was always to ask the question, what are the things I'm bad at? Right. And too often as athletes, because it's uncomfortable to make mistakes, because we don't like to fail, because we don't like to look stupid in our front of our friends, we tend to play strong handed. We tend to do the things that we're good at over and over and over again, because it avoids us looking like a schmo on the field. To me, the question that I think is more important is what are the things that I can't do well and how do I get better at that? Because I wasn't really an A plus in anything as a lacrosse player, but what I was able to do is I was able to eliminate weaknesses from my game. I could feed, I could shoot on the run, I could shoot time and room, I could shoot righty, I could shoot lefty. The fact that I had that versatility and I didn't have those gaps in my game meant that if somebody came out to guard me, they didn't know that I wanted to go righty. They didn't know that I actually preferred to go lefty. Right. So I think anytime you're dealing with young players, it's so much easier to become a decent righty and lefty player than it is to become a highly elite one handed player. All right. Another another stick work drill for middies that's going to be mimicking our one three two offense. And now if you look here, I've added this third guy. OK, now I put all these cones down. And when this drill when this drill is executed, it's going to look a little bit more complicated than it is. But this is basically looking at two different, a fade. So we have midfield triangle fade throwback. We're looking at a fade option, which means if this is the strong side of the field, the fade is going to be out the back side, right? And our premise is 90% of the, the, the lacrosse teams in America slide out of the crease. So what we do as offense is, is we try to vacate or move the crease. We try to take that guy who's being guarded by the slider and move him someplace where the defense is vulnerable. Now, if you go against a sliding defense, where are they going to leave somebody open? It's going to be as far from the ball as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this crease guy and we're going to fade him out the backside where the defense is vulnerable. And we're going to try to get the ball to him as soon as possible. So again, this drill is going to start out with a righty dodge down the side. Now, this is going to be a little bit more realistic to our 1-3-2 offense than the previous drill because now this backside midi has the responsibility to balance the field. 
One of the things that I'm constantly emphasizing from an offensive standpoint is the idea of balance and spacing, right? We always want these three midfielders to have the same amount of space between them, and we want them to be in this triangle. So as this guy, right, it's the same concept where if we're thinking defensively, we often hear, right, you're attached by a band, right? And as we rotate as a defensive triangle, we want to all stay together. The same is true offensively with our midfield rotations. So as this dodging midi comes down this side, we've got to balance up the top of the field. Why do we do that? Number one, we want to provide an outlet, right? If we imagine an attackman here, so in our one three two, we would have a wing attackman out here. He's going to cut through to create space, forcing his D guy to decide, am I cutting through or am I sliding? What am I doing? There's going to be an attackman rolling over as an outlet. That's one spot for this midi to release the ball. Now we're going to have two when this guy rolls over. Again, fading out the backside, following to this cone. What I would actually suggest is rather than having this cone, and I should have corrected this, rather than having this cone uh, on the same line parallel with these, I would actually put it a little bit higher above this restraining line. So we're following high, which is maintaining that spacing that we want. So here's what this drill is looking like. Again, fade out the backside, boom immediately get it to the back side. Now we throw all the way back across the triangle and this drill continues. This guy can then dodge down this side. We hit the trailer and we just continue to rotate like that. Okay, we'll go back through it again. Boom, rotate, throw back, throw to the back side, back to the initial line and we're good to go. All right. Now, Pop throwback. This is a different variation. So now if you're running your 1-3-2 offense and you're at a little bit of a higher level, you want to have two potential calls in your 1-3-2 offense, this could be your pop offense. And what this means, this is something that Coach Metz at Carolina used a couple years ago, and he put his best attackman in here on the crease. And he, wanted, and he would pop his best attackman straight up the field so that he was essentially, if you it's, this is kind of a complex thing to get into, but it's kind of interesting. So he would pop this middle attackman on the crease. He would pop him up the middle of his offense. And if you think about it, right, if your midi dodges somebody and beats him, we're creating a six on five situation. So now we're putting our best attackman, right? This would be Ryan Boyle running the top, the point, and your three, three man up offense. And if you're able to move the ball quickly enough, your attackman who's comfortable running a three, three offense is going to be right in this spot. And he's going to be able to find these skip feeding lanes to the crease, to the low wings, and it can be really effective. So this is an alternative motion that we can add in where rather than fading out the backside, we're going to pop this midi straight up the middle. And again, I would move this cone up above the restraining line to get more space, but this is going to give you another way of using a stick work drill to work on your set offense. Okay. Again, it gets to the backside. We go back to the top line, everybody rotates and we continue on from there. Okay, one of the things I want you guys to look at, whenever you're dealing, right, whether you have this, this top two offense, whether it's a one three two or it's a two two two, after the dodge, it's gonna open up into that kind of umbrella look where you're gonna have a midi out here who dodged, a midi up top who's in that trail position, and a midi who's wide. So anytime, right, Duke runs this two 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 motion kind of offense, and what they quickly do is after that initial dodge, they have two attackmen at X, they have an attackman on the crease, and then they have their three middies in that umbrella set, which is how a lot of college teams basically start their offenses at this point. So again, with this pop and this fade offense, this rotation, you'll see we immediately open up and there's our umbrella look that we're gonna try to get. That's spreading out our defense, that's gonna open up passing lanes. All right, so again, we can easily make this into a shooting drill. All of our balls start over here. Boom, we're gonna dodge down. We're gonna pop up the middle. We're gonna throw, we're gonna to throw to the backside and we're gonna get that shot. Kyle Dixon made a career on getting this, on taking his crease man, guarded by Brody Merrill. He'd take him to the crease, he would pop, he would fade out the backside and he would get all these wide open shots and he was one of the best shooters several play. So putting your shooter in on the crease here and either fading him or getting him to the backside so he can get a shot here this is gonna be an excellent thing for a base offense to, to execute. All right, any questions here? All right, okay, some final thoughts on these rollback and stick work drills. 
Um, as I said, both drills can be run easily as a stick work only or as a shooting drill. Um, both drills can be run for a right-handed backside shot or a left. So again, practice both the righty and lefty shot. Make sure that your middies are ambidextrous. Um, again, both drills can incorporate the turn to the outside technique or the pull pass. And then, as I said, again, just to reiterate, right, we have our one through two, 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 two motion offense schemes baked into these stick work drills. It's a great way of practicing them. Um, and then, as I said, both drills are reinforcing that good communication. Um, and then as I, as, as I like with all of these, these stick work drills, I love it when I can have one drill quickly transition from stick work to shooting and back. So often I'll set up one of these drills on one end, on one side of the field, one of these drills on the other, and I'll just have the guys switch. Then you can switch to lefty, then you can switch to the different sides, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, this is another shooting drill that I love for middies. It starts out in our triangle set here. What I do with this drill is I typically have a coach as this secondary feeder. So I have two lines, which allows me to get away with having about six players running this drill. This can be attackmen and this can be middies. It doesn't matter. Um, this is a combination, I call it a combination shooting drill because we're gonna be getting a time and room shot and an on the run shot from the same drill. What's gonna happen here, we're gonna start with the balls over here. We're gonna have a pass up to this point guy. This guy's gonna receive the pass left-handed. He's gonna split across and again, right across his face, slam it across, extend those arms, run away from that hand into that alley shot. And as soon as this guy throws the ball, He's going to then cut up, and what I would do just to, uh, with this cone, I would slide it a little bit to the back side because with younger players, they have a tendency to run past the cone. We don't want that to happen. We want this to be a time and room shot where they receive the pass in the stationary spot and are ready to let it fly. So potentially move this cone a little bit to the back side, and this is what it's going to look like. Pass up, into our on the run, shot on the run, boom, time and room shot, and they replace. And again, as soon as, as soon as these guys release these shots, the next guy should be going. It's a continuous drill. It goes again and again and again. If you want, if you have good backup goalies, this is a great place to stash backup goalies. You can put coaches here, whatever you want to do. It's a great drill to be, in, be involved in, and you can keep the pace, et cetera, if you're the coach feeding here. I typically find that if I have players here, they kind of zone out, and the drill doesn't run as effectively. One more time, we'll go through it. Feed up, on the run, feed to that time and room shot, and there you have it. And then they just replace to the lines. All right, so let's, let's transition here into part two and let's get into this, let's, let's dive into this sort of one-on-one -on -one in this dodging, dodging portion. And this is gonna be review for those of you got, who had Mitch, um, we're, we're on there for the defensive talk, but he talks a lot about the heart. And I like to think about the heart from a defensive perspective. And going back and looking at that 1999 film of me playing attack, one of the things that I noticed right away was the fact that I was still sort of in this early stage of my development as a lacrosse player where I was very conscious of what I was doing every time I had the ball. I wasn't comfortable enough understanding how the offense worked so that I was able to play sort of outside my helmet. And I always talk about the two the two levels of sort of intellectual thinking that go on in an athlete's brain as they're playing a sport, right? I have the micro personal things that I'm dealing with. I'm concentrating on catching a ball. I'm concentrating on my defender. I'm concentrating on all the things that are happening right here. And then I have this macro thing that I have to be aware of where I know what the other guys on the field are doing defensively, offensively, so I can adjust. It took me playing with Ryan Boyle, frankly, to develop that side of my game, to really understand how I was a small piece in a larger puzzle. Because my experience of playing lacrosse was my job was beat my guy and then make a play. And so when I realized that my job was to beat my guy and then understand what was going on at an offensive level beyond me, that's when I really sort of took this leap as a player. And part of that is understanding how defensive defenses play, oddly enough. So I want to talk about the heart and what is the heart, right? So the heart is the most dangerous area on the field. Defensively, our job is to protect it. Offensively, that means our job is basically to attack it and figure out the best ways of attacking it. So when we look at the heart, 
what we're basically doing is we're splitting up the field like this, okay? And these are, for the most part, the ways that we're gonna attack the goal. We're gonna be dodging from X, we're gonna attack the right side, we're gonna be dodging from X, we're gonna attack the left side, we're gonna be dodging from the wing, dodging from the wing, dodging from up top, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at these lovely little defensemen here, they're all playing good defensive position, okay? Hips facing the end line, hips facing the end line, forcing these guys to go under, not getting beaten top side. Over here, forcing this guy under. So essentially what these defensemen are doing is they're defending these lines. If I'm a defensive player playing on this wing line, I don't have to stop my guy from getting to the goal or beating me. I've just got to make sure that when he beats me, he beats me going in this direction so that it's a low percentage shot. So when we think about this space, right, when we now switch over to offense and we think about this from an offensive standpoint, let's think about this area and think about what we're trying to do to draw a slide, to get our offense moving, is we want to cross this line and get to the heart. We want to get to this most dangerous area of the field because that's the only way the defense is going to have to do this. Okay, so we're going to start, as I said, right, I played predominantly offensive midi, but when my offensive midfield game really took a leap and I really developed as a player, it was when I began to understand how defense was played. So we're going to start by thinking about how middies play defense, okay? So our goals defensively as a D midi, right, we're trying to, as I said, we're trying to protect the heart, we're trying to win our one-on-one -on -one matchup. Again, everything with middies comes back to that one-on-one -on -one matchup, okay? We're trying to protect the heart off ball. That means if we're in a support or sliding position, we've got to have one foot inside, right? If we go back to that, to that heart, we've got to have one, one foot inside those lines. And then last, we've got to slide if that's our responsibility. So on ball, this is Molly, right? KB? Can't tell? I think that's small. It's legendary, legendary Cannons D midi right there. No, it's not. Um, that's, that's Max. Is that Max? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, there you go. Legendary, legendary wow. Cannons midfielder, Max Siebold. Um, there Smalley we go. Okay. Will be happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he, I'm sure he will. Uh, Smalley will be like, you, what? You thought I was Max Siebold? That's awesome. Um, so as we had this picture back here, right, I have this guy landing an airport, right, at the airport landing a plane. I did that for a reason, okay? When we're playing D midi, that's effectively what we are doing. We are making sure that we are landing that aircraft exactly where the defensive guys behind me want that guy to go. My job is not necessarily to stop my guy from scoring, right? When I got to Princeton, I was coming from a school in New England. I hadn't played really high level lacrosse. I got to Princeton and I had no idea what I was doing. I went down to the defensive end. I'd been my, an attackman my entire life. I was terrified. Coach T was frothing at the mouth, yelling obscene things at me, telling me I was a terrible lacrosse player. And then he's like, now I want you to play defense. And I was like, coach, I have no idea how to play defense. And he's like, Streets, it's easy. All you have to do is get beat to the right spot. And so, right, when we go back and we think about, and Coach T was the guy who redefined the way defense was played because he got to Princeton and he realized, hmm, what do I have? I've got a cupboard full of a bunch of rocket scientists, a bunch of econ majors, a bunch of guys who are super smart and can't run by a garbage can. And I have to somehow defend Tom Merchek and Gary Gate and Roy Colsey and all these outstanding Syracuse middies. How am I going to do that? So what Coach T devised was he said, I'm going to get beat. My defensive middies are going to get beat. I've just got to make sure that they get beat where the defensive players behind them know where they're going to be, know how to slide. So as a D midi, right, my job is basically to say, hey, all the guys behind me, I'm bad at D, but I'm going to be good enough at D to make sure that when I get beat, it's going to be down the alley. It's going to be to this specific, less dangerous spot so that when we slide, it's going to be to the advantage of our, def of our defense, right? Coach T took away the unpredictability, right? Unpredictability plays into the offense's hands. Coach T's defense and the way most people play defense now is designed to eliminate that uncertainty. It's to make an offense predictable. So middies are the guys with the orange batons. When we approach the ball, this is exactly the same way Mitch described with his defenseman. We're going to come out. We're going to take a good angle, pushing that guy, take away the top side. We're going to dictate where the offense can and can't go. Okay. The reason we're going to dictate that is if I go out and I take away top side and all the guys behind me 
can rely on me to not give up the top side come hell or high water, that means that they know they're sliding to a specific spot. If I then get beat top side, now I've not only been beat myself, the slide has been beat. So now we're in a situation, we're not just man down, we're two men down because I didn't do my job effectively. That's where this whole top side concept comes in. It's eliminating basically that half of the field. So I'm gonna break down, I'm gonna have my butt down, my chest up, my stick out, and I'm gonna be steering that guy down that alley away from that, that, that dangerous area. With defensemen, we're gonna limit stick checks. Middies, right, you can lift, you can cross check. I can tell you the, the thing that I most loved as an offensive midi was guys who threw wrap checks because that was basically committing themselves behind me. I was able to run. I could then switch hands, Z dodge, get under them and attack the heart. Guys who just stood there and just cross checked the you know what out of me. Those were the guys that really frustrated me because you couldn't get by them. Okay. And that brings us to this last point. Let's be physical. Okay. We all know at this point that we don't have to have our hands together when we play defense. We can have our hands apart. We can push with our top hand. We can push with our bottom hand. Obviously, we can't extend and cross check, but there's a lot of leeway with our top and bottom hand to steer those middies where we want them to go. Also, last but not least here, let's initiate contact as defensive middies. When we're doing one-on-ones, let's get our middies in the habit of going out and confronting, cutting that grass, getting in guys' ways, and slowing them down. Okay, that's where we get to that closed ground. Okay, on-ball basics when engaged. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to go through this quick, whoops, sorry. I put up these two images here because we, we have Coach Belial on the bottom, and I apologize for the grainy photos, but I wanted to show you here, right? So when we talk about playing a half step to behind, and I was talking about how we want to eliminate a rollback situation, okay? If we look at this guy up here, and he's probably a high school player, if we look at how hard he's overcommitting to the front side of this guy, trying to cut him off. Now, the problem with this is if there's a slide already coming and this guy has the vision to see that slide, what's he going to do? He's going to use that split and sprawl technique that we worked on in our shooting drill. He's going to stick a foot in the ground. He's going to roll back. This D midi is going to overcommit. He's going to keep coming forward. And now two guys are going to be taken out of the play. And this guy's going to be able to survey the field, step in, shoot, step in, move the ball. Now, if we look at Mitch Belial, right? One of the best defensemen played in MLL, right? He's in excellent position here. He's on the back shoulder. If you notice, he's using, he's probably a little bit high with this hand, but Mitch is like superhumanly strong so he can get away with it. But he's playing with his arms and he's using them to steer this. To, this actually is Billy McGlone, I'm pretty sure. Coach McGlone, where he wants him to go. So again, if this guy here in this top photo if he's dodging down the alley, this midi has already overcommitted and lost this battle, right? A smart midi now is either going to split back to the middle, he's going to swim dodge him, or he's going to roll. You are not going to be able to get top side on Mitch Belial. He's going to let you beat him under, but there's no way in hell you're going to get back to the top side. And that means that Mitch has taken away the offense's predictability. He's made it off. It's obvious for the guys behind him. Okay, and he's driving with his legs, not with his arms. When we drive with our arms, we are like offensive linemen, right? If you push and you get out overextended, you're off balance, you lose your matchup, right? I hated going against guys like Mitch who were five feet 11, strong as a boulder because they would just sit on my hips and they would nail me and nail me and nail me. I love going against big, tall, rangy guys because they would get up around my shoulders and I could get lower than them and I could win that battle for leverage right? A one-on-one -on -one physically is a, is a battle for leverage. Mitch is driving with his legs. He's not stopping his feet. And then last but not least, this idea for middies, and this goes for offense and defense. As a midi, your job is never done, right? Attackmen, when they finish riding, they're done. They get to stand around and talk with their defensemen, do whatever they want, wait for the ball to come back. Defensemen, when they clear the ball and it gets to the offensive end, they get to stand around. Middies, as soon as we turn the ball over, we've now got to get back. As soon as we gain possession, we've got to get forward. With middies, our job is constantly changing. That's why guys who play soccer, guys who play other sports, guys who play sports where that kind of mentality is bred are going to be really effective as middies. Okay, so again, we talked about this. Why take away the top side? Let's look at Mitch again. These are some great photos of Mitch going against Pete Pouillon. What hand is Pete Pouillon? I'll give you one guess, right? 
Look at here. He's splitting under and he's keeping this in his right hand. He wanted to get back to his right hand at all costs. Look at Mitch in this bottom picture, okay? There's a good yard between him and Pete, but Mitch has won this battle because he's flush Pete. If we remember that line, right? He's run Pete all the way down that dashed line to where Pete is now behind the cage. He's feeding with his uncomfortable left hand. If he decides to roll back, which Mitch knows he's probably going to, Mitch is in a good trail position, ready to slide. And we've got Matt Casey here, ready to slide, okay? So this is an ideal position, right? Mitch is playing trail shoulder. He's staying wide, staying, keeping Pete under, and he's making sure that we're getting a lower quality shot. We're forcing this player into a slide, and we're also putting Pete in a position where he's, less, he's, he's not going to be as comfortable as if he got to his strength. And again, job is never done. Okay, so let's go back. Let's look at the heart just for review because we're now going to move on to offense, and we're going to talk about how we attack this. Okay, so when I went back and I was watching that clip of me and I said, right, I had no idea what I was doing. One of the things I noticed about myself in that 1999 clip is I was a reactive offensive player. I was somebody who was looking at my defender and I was saying, what is he doing and what am I going to do to counter that? What I want to train my young players is I want to train them to have a plan. So whenever I'm doing one-on-ones with young players, I'll go up to the guy who's next in line and I'll pull him aside and I'll say, hey, what are you going to do? What are you trying to get, right? What is your goal for this one-on-one -on -one rep, okay? And so what we want to do is, right, if I'm a righty, I want to figure out how to get to my right hand. Okay, if, I, if I'm a righty and I like to get to my left hand, I'm going to set up trying to get to that strength so that if it's, if it's not taken away, I'm getting my strength. If it's taken away, now I have those complementary those complimentary moves, but I want to make sure that I have a plan going into my one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, and again, right, I want to pick spots that play to my strengths. I like to dodge from the top high three wing spots. I didn't love dodging from the low wings. But you can, you can get away with bringing attackmen on as middies. They can invert. There's a lot of flexibility. But as an offensive player, right, as a coach, let's help these players figure out what their strengths are and let's put them in spots where they're going to succeed, okay? And then the other thing here is, and these last three are kind of, they're kind of bundled together. We're going to talk a lot about angles when we talk about dodging because when I watch young players dodge, the most common mistake I see made is they end up dodging the gr to the grass. They dodge to open space rather than dodging the guy who's guarding them, right, rather than having a plan. You got a question okay. here. Yeah, yeah. I'm not 100% sure. He's saying, do you get your middies to switch hands when playing defense? Great question. Do I, do, so, so do I want MIDI switching hands playing defense? With poles, with long sticks, I typically have long sticks stay in their comfortable, strong hand. With short sticks, because it's basically a club, I'm comfortable with MIDI switching hands if they want to. I like, I like a MIDI who's comfortable, right? So if you look at this MIDI here, he's got his stick in a lefty position. So if this guy's a righty, I'm okay with him coming out and having the head of his stick up field. If he's, if he's not comfortable doing that, and if this ends up in a ground ball situation, our priority is him getting that ground ball, him having his strong hand available, that may be more beneficial. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a way, whatever you want. If you think you have a player who's competent enough that they can switch hands and then switch back to pick up a ground ball or can get out, switch hands, keep the head of the stick up field, and then is comfortable picking up a ground ball with their left hand, that's ideal. It's not imperative because as I said, right, we're basically just using our top and our bottom hand to steer where those guys are going. Okay, it's not necessarily really to have the head of the stick upfield. I kind of like it because it gives an illusion of length, right? It makes it seem like, oh, I can't go that way because there's a stick, but it's not critical. It's a great question, though. Um, so, so when we're attacking these most dangerous spots, so what, when I talk about dodging grass, and you'll, you'll spot this immediately with youth players because – you can tell right away, right, the, what kind of a youth lacrosse player you have as a dodger. Do you have a guy who's faster than everybody out there, in which case he's just going to run by them, and that's great. Let him do it until he comes up against somebody who can stop him. Do you have somebody who's afraid of physical contact? Do you have somebody who's slow? 
typically with young players who are lacking in confidence, when they see a defender come out and play them like this, and again, this is good defensive position. This seems crazy. And when you put a youth lacrosse player with hips facing to the sideline when he's guarding this guy, basically inviting him to go this way, this guy is going to be like, this is crazy. I feel uncomfortable doing it. And this offensive player is going to be like, oh, cool. I'm just going to run straight into this space. That's actually not beneficial for the offensive player. And so I remember, again, the first few practices when I got to Princeton and Chris Barrier and Winship Ross and all these D-Middies came out to guard me and I was a dummy just running into this space. They would, they would let me run and then they would meet me at this point of contact and they would just drive me down this line and I would end up taking these sort of fall away alley shots that were low percentage, low angle shots, okay? So we get up in this situation. That's what we're talking about, right? He dodged the grass, not the man. So what we want to look for is this idea of angles opening up doors. If I want, if I'm right here and I want this alley dodge, right? So if I, would, if I were in this position, what I would do is I would start with my stick in the right hand and I would dodge right at this guy. So if he's up here guarding me like this, I'm not going to run this way unless I know I can just run away from him. I'm going to run right at him because if you listen to Mitch's D talk, what he'll tell you is your first three steps as a defender, just like if you're a defensive back in football, unless you're playing press coverage, your first three steps are always backwards. So if, this, if I run right at this defender and his first three steps are backwards, what is he doing? He's conceding ground to the middle of the field, which means that now when I split into the alley, I'm going to be attacking into the heart, into the dangerous area. I'm going to have more angle on this shot. I'm going to have more likelihood of drawing a slide. It's going to be better for my offense overall. So again, if I have a lefty over here and he wants this alley, he has got to dodge at this directly at this defender and then split into the alley. So it looks like this, boom, into the heart. And now we're getting to that. Okay, this is critical. Now, if we're trying to get to the middle of the field, right? So if now I have my lefty over on this side of the field, now it switches, right? I want to try to lure my defensive player to come make contact with me here. And then I'm going to split back to the middle or I'm going to swim dodge back to the middle. And this is where that swim dodge is actually acceptable right? You're getting this defensive midi to overcommit. And now you're going to sort of push him right under and you're going to get back to the middle of the field. So it's going to look like this, right? I'm going to put, uh, sorry, this is, this is getting the alley again. We're going to go, we'll skip through that. So this is getting to the middle. Okay. So we're going to go down into the grass, down into the grass, lure him down, and then we're going to split back across his momentum. So it's boom. Now I'm attacking to the middle of the field. But in order to get that, so again, when you go up to your midi and you have a righty over here on this side of the field and you say, hey, man, what's your plan? What are you going to do here? And he's like, I'm going to try to split left to right to get to the middle of the field. You're like, great, awesome. How are you going to do it? He's like, well, I'm going to take four steps into the alley and then I'm going to try to swim him or I'm going to split right, right back across my face into the middle of the field. Get in the habit of asking your offensive player, what's your plan? What are you trying to get? because then they're gonna become intentional dodgers rather than reactive dodgers. Boom, back to the middle. Okay, same thing over here. Attack the alley, boom, get back to the middle. Okay, so again, as I say here, on this secondary counter move, this can be a roll dodge, safest, but it's slow. A split dodge, which is harder, but it's quicker, right? If I split, I've gotta make sure I have enough space to exchange hands so that trail punch hand doesn't potentially hit me. Or if I'm tall or if I'm capable of doing it, this is a great time to use that, that swim move. Okay, last but not least. So this is just a concept for all of your drills. And I mentioned this briefly earlier. I want to reiterate it here. When you're doing one-on-ones, too often we do one-on-ones and we just assume that one-on-ones are just about this one-on-one -on -one matchup. Let's remind players that this one-on-one -on -one never happens in a real game. We never have two guys, unless you're playing at a summer tournament that ends in a Braveheart, you never have two guys going one-on-one -on -one with no one else on the field, except in practice. So let's make sure that we don't get, right, your grandfather's 1v1, where the kids run all around the field and they do 18 laps around the goal, and then finally one guy's tired and falls over. So what we're gonna do with our one-on-ones is we're gonna shrink the field, we're gonna condense the field, and we're gonna make them a little bit more prescriptive. Okay, this is a great drill that um, I got from some guys at Middlebury, and um, I, I love it. And it's, so if you look at this setup, look how tight to the goal we are. 
And this is like, I want these guys no more than 10 yards, right? This arc can be at 10 yards. And if you have a goalie who's brave, put him in there. If you don't have a goalie who wants to get shelled, don't because he's going to get shelled in this drill. And what we're going to do is we are going to start, right? This is Ryan and Mitch call these short 1v1s where you've, you've effectively engaged these two players. So this is a coach, right? The coaches are always delineated by their nice brown hair here. So coach here standing in the middle. And then we've got this D midi already in good position on this, on this shoulder, okay? So we're, they're not gonna be touching, but there's like a foot of space between these guys. So what we've taken away is the midfield, midfielder's best asset, which is running. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have this coach, he's gonna, he's, this D mid, he's not gonna be able to see him. This coach is gonna hold up either a one or a two, right? And this is what I mean by prescriptive. We're gonna dictate to our players where they have to go. So now, rather than just asking a kid, hey, what's your plan? We're giving a kid, we're saying, hey, this is what you have to do. So we're gonna to start to train them to get specific things. So now if I hold up a one, right? This guy is gonna to have to do an alley dodge. He's gonna to have to engage this defensive midfielder on his top hand. He's gotta push him into the middle of the field, get separation so that when he splits, he's not way out here in this bad, below that hash line. Now, when you're doing these drills, right? I love, and I, and I should have said this earlier, if you're able to put cones down right along those lines, if you can draw, if you have a practice field, put the heart there and spray paint. So your defensive players know what they're defending. Your offensive players know if they're outside this, it's a low percentage shot, okay? So again, on this execution, boom, push to the middle of the field, and then we get that shot, okay? So it's attack to the middle, split, and shoot. And again, this guy on this side would probably be shooting with his left hand, but you get the idea. We're gonna start with these guys fully engaged before they make their moves. Backside, now we're getting top side. And again, if you look at this, right? If this guy's going two, if he's told to get top side, he's got to attack this grass. And then this is where he's splitting, swimming, rolling, whatever it is. But when you're doing this drill, each guy gets no more than two moves. So this happens quickly. So when you have D guys that win these matchups, let those D guys win. That's a win for them. Get that group off, get on to the next group. This is an awesome drill and it, and it eliminates a lot of that sort of, that, the question of, are we gonna do V cuts to get open before we do one-on-ones? Is there gonna be too much space? Do I have one kid who's super fast and is constantly beating everybody and he's not getting any work? Now we're gonna take away all that space and you match him up against a kid who's strong and see if he can actually create separation when he's not able to run. It's an awesome drill, I love that one. Okay, this is another one that we used a lot um, with the Rochester Rattlers and it's, it's, you can use it with high school kids, you can use it with youth kids. And this is one that's kind of nice because with the previous drill, and I used it, right? We, we, with this drill, we've condensed space, we've taken away space. Now what we're gonna do in this next drill is we're gonna give it all back. We're gonna intentionally create these kind of, these kind of channels where guys have to run. And the way this drill works, coach here, right? Brown hair, coach here, brown hair. You can obviously run this one-sided if you don't have a million coaches and a million players. Just run it on one side and then switch it over to the other. The other thing you can then do is you can run this from the top down and it can be an attack dodging drill, okay? It's great both ways. So it's gonna start with, coach is just gonna roll a ball out here. So we're gonna get a little uncontested ground ball to start. Then these two players, right? This offensive player has to run all the way down around this cone, right? And then he's gotta get up high and turn. This defensive player has to run down around this interior cone, which is gonna force him to get upfield in a good position, forcing that guy under, okay? So what we're doing here is by creating these channels, now we're gonna, you'll find, right, the first couple guys who do this, they're gonna run up, they're gonna run up, they're gonna hug this cone, they're gonna run across right here, and then they're gonna have no opportunity to get any run. And you're gonna have one guy who's gonna be like, wait, I can run as high as I want, and he's gonna be the first guy. I love doing this because I would pick up the ground ball, I would run way out here, I would run like this, and then I would come downhill 
on this angle right at this cone, which now if you look, right, if I went all the way out here, bent this around and came downhill, now I'm attacking right at this guy, right at this defender. I'm not running into the alley and ending up with this low percentage shot. I'm pushing this defender back into the middle of the field. So if I split into the alley, I have a high percentage shot and I can also go over the top. So the execution on this, ground ball, okay? We roll it out, the guys go, pick up the ground ball, boom, we loop around, and now we're engaged in that one-on-one. -on -one. And then as soon as they're done, you can get the other side going, or you can just run it off this side. Any questions on this drill? All good? All right. This next one, another, right? So, so these are three one-on-one -on -one drills, right? We've got this, this, we've given the space back. We took it away with the first drill. We're giving it back. And now with this last drill, we're changing the angle a little bit. So now we're taking our D middies, we're putting them right here and we're setting up this sort of three cone setup here. And depending on how you wanna run this drill, right? If, if you have middies who are fast and they can get across, you can move them a little bit further this way. You can, you can have them cover more ground. Another thing that you can do that's sometimes beneficial is just put a coach here and have all the offensive players over here, all the defensive players here. That way, as a coach, you can sort of dictate if this kid, if you see, if you see Matt come up in line and you know that he's not the fleetest of foot, you're going to wait on this transfer pass a little bit longer to give him time to get over. So again, what this is doing here is we're feeding this up here. It's going to be a pass up to the top, a pass to the backside. So we're echoing all those stick work drills that we were doing where we get that double, 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 one more, get it to the backside. Now we're really hammering on that pass, pass, redodge concept, but we're also bringing in this good approach angle where we're running, bending this around and we're forcing this guy under. And what we want this guy to do, right, is we want him to try to get to the middle of the field, to try to beat that guy top side. So it looks like this. Throw, bang, that's obviously a very quick transfer pass, but you get the idea. And notice, this guy takes a nice bent, curved run, taking away the top side. If he's going to get beat here, it's got to be under, okay? And as you get, right, if you get better and better D-mids, they can, they can bend this a little bit less. If you have a really, really strong D-mid who can approach sort of straight up and not give up the alley, that's great. Just make sure he never gets beat top side. And then again, you can flop this to the other side and you can run off this righty alley. These are, these are just three great one-on-one -on -one drills to get guys really learning good angles, approaching how they're doing these things. Okay, so all of these one-on-one -on -one drills, let's build it up into, this is, my, this, is my, this is my favorite thing to do in lacrosse. It's this 2v1 ground balls into 3v3. You've all done it, I'm sure. It's a very simple drill. It's, it's done all over the place. But what this does is now we're taking those 3v3 concepts. What's the question you get from every kid when you do a practice? Coach, are we going to scrimmage today? No, we're not going to scrimmage. We don't have two goalies. We don't have enough guys but we can do this mini field 3v3. You can play this basketball style half court. You can play this up and down. It's up to you. Offensive uh, breakdown, overview, sorry. What we're looking for in this drill, what's great about this is we can harp on those three on three concepts that we want out of our six on six motion offense, but that we're not getting. Okay, because this 3v3 is the bedrock of our six on six offense. And we just have three guys out there. So they've got to get used to, these, this fade, this clear through concept, whenever somebody, so you can have very simple, simple rules in this three on three. They can be as simple as if somebody dodges towards you, you have to clear through, you have to create space. Okay. If somebody dodges away from you, you have to follow and balance up, right? Very simple, simple rules. And then the other thing that I'm constantly harping on with young players is too often we have a kid who has the ball and he doesn't identify what his role is. We have a kid off ball. We don't know what he wants to be. We need the kid with the ball to identify himself as a dodger, right? He's revving up, ready to go. He's ready to move the ball, right? He's a feeder. He's looking for help or he's a shooter and he's cocked and he's ready to let it fly. Okay. And then the basic, the basic thing to hit on in this is let's never stand. And this is just set up like this, right? We've got white, blue, white, or white, dark, dark, white, dark, white, dark, and coach is just rolling this in. And you can play this, right? You can play this restraining box to restraining box, or if you want it even smaller, you can put the goals 
right here and right here, and you can play on this small field. It's a great way to get this three on three going, but what you can also, right, because when you first run this drill, right, you roll the ball out, these guys run in, they're all gonna run immediately to the ball. You're gonna get six players running immediately to the ball, and then as you, as you move along, right, you're going to start to see, you're going to start to see the attackman when that ball rolls in, rather than going for the ball, you're going to get that attackman who's just going to run right to the, right to the, the, the sweet spot right here and just sit there ready to catch the ball. And what that's going to do is that's going to force one of these offensive or defensive players to get in and guard him. Okay, so as you're doing this, and you can do this strictly with middies, or you can do it with all your players. And what you want to do is you want to you want to look and find out: Do I have do I have defensemen who are flying down on offense all the time rather than getting in good defensive spot? Do I have offensive players who are constantly getting stuck on the defensive end? And you can slowly start to organize so that things start to make a little bit more sense. Okay. The last drill, last drill we're going we're gonna to go through here because I know we're short on time um, is, is, is my favorite drill. It's, it's just this three-on-two, two-on-one basketball drill. And, and this is a drill that I usually do strictly with middies because, as I said earlier, our middies have to know every aspect of the transition game, right? They have to understand how to play defense. They have to understand how to play offense. And they've got to do the running, okay? So our transition offense is about – moving the ball, drawing defensive pressure, and finding the backside two-on-one. Our transition defense is basically about killing time until reinforcements arrive. So this mini field 3v2, 2v1 basketball drill is set up. It's a little bit like Wes Jenny in the sense that we're going to start with two defensemen in. We've got a coach over here with balls. And we're going to start by sending our three, three offensive players down. Now, I run this as a last touch drill, meaning the last guy to touch it, you have to get back on defense. If, you're having, if your players have a tough time identifying whether they touched it last, just pick a line. Just say this line here, your responsibility after, th after the three on two is to get back on defense. This drill also emphasizes that concept of my job is never done. It's just changing. So you're going to start to train that idea of, oh, wow, we just played offense. We turned it over. What do I do? Am I staying here? Am I getting back on defense? How does this work? Okay, so again, we roll this out. We come down in the three on two. We're going to play out our three on two. Boom, we get a shot on the backside. And then we're going to leave our last touch guy in. He's going to get back on D. And now we're going two on one headed in the opposite direction. As soon as this two on one heads this way, these guys are set up here for the next three on two coming down and it's a continuous drill that works that way. It's excellent for conditioning. It's excellent for training um, our, our transition three on two concepts. And one of the things, just, just to emphasize here, and this is a drill that you run constantly when you, play, when you play professional indoor box or you play real Canadian box lacrosse because what they teach you is these wing guys – they, they're taught in indoor, you're taught to, as soon as you're released, right? As soon as this ball, as soon as the ball's in play, these wing guys fly down the field. They don't wait. They don't look. They immediately gun down the field and get to these low posts to put pressure on the defense, okay? We want to actually bring the ball, right? In basketball, you typically want to get the ball to the middle of the floor so that that guy can operate. In lacrosse, we want to draw because – we can potentially break this three on two with two passes. If this guy stays wide and draws this defender, this I formation this way, we immediately have our backside two on one. And if you watch the way I've set this up, this guy ends up drawing and we immediately have a pass to the trailer. And this is vital, right? This guy can't get too tight. He's got to stay above this midfield line. He's got to stay high enough that when he catches the ball, he can step in and be a threat to shoot. He can step in without getting checked. He gets his hands free. He's able to execute. So again, if we watch this, boom, we're in a trail position. And now we found our two on one on the backside. And then two passes, we're going to get a good shot on cage. Okay. And then we go back the other way. And now our D guys who are just playing D are now in a two on one situation headed back this way. All right. So final thoughts. I just threw a ton of information at you guys in a very, very short window of time. I appreciate you guys' patience, listening. Um, final thoughts about this, okay? Middies, right, middies are the guys that have to, 
you you see in a lot of a lot of young teams, middies are typically just the guys who can run. They're just these athletes, and attackmen get all the credit for being the smart guys, the decision makers, et cetera, et cetera. If you actually look at lacrosse and you go behind the sort of curtain, you're going to realize that midfielders are actually asked to do more thinking more quickly than any other position on the field, right? That job, I've hit on it a number of times, your job never ends. It's just constantly changing. So middies have to be able to quickly adapt from playing offense to playing defense, from riding to clearing, et cetera, et cetera. As I said in the beginning, let's emphasize with all of our players, but in our middies especially, this cross-sport experience. Get soccer players, get football players, get guys who are good in the open field so that when they come to lacrosse, they can use those skills here. I'm going to hit on it again. I've hit on it a bunch of times. Middies have to be able to play both-handed. It's too easy to take away a strong hand from a midfielder and force him to a weak spot. If you look at all the best, best midfielders to ever play the game, if you look at Tommy Schreiber, you look at Rabel, you look at Max Siebold, you look at me, all of us were able to play equally, equally well with our right and left hand. That meant it was impossible to take away any side of the field. Okay? Now, last but not least, right, let's, let's think about midfielders creatively. Let's use this as a way of getting attackmen on the field. Put them in invert situations. If you have attackmen who are really good wing dodgers, but they're maybe smaller, bring them in as midfielders and let them go in invert situations. If you have, if you have 45 attackmen on your team, get them in comfortable running those midfield lines so that they understand the whole offense, not just what it looks like from the low right wing or from behind the cage. When I moved from attack to midfield and realized how wide open the game was, that's where all of my athletic skills suddenly became valuable to me because I had so much more space and I was done sort of seeing the field just through the lens of behind the cage looking for feeds. Um, and let's say it again, right? Every lacrosse team is only as good as its midfielders. You look at all the best teams, all the championship teams, they've typically had great face-off guys, great D middies, and great goaltending, okay? The guys that run up and down the field, the guys that do that dirty work, those are the guys that are going to make your team successful. Um, I guess at this point, KB, we've got a few more minutes. We want to open it up for questions. Again, I threw a ton at you. Um, you guys are probably ready to go enjoy some time. Wait, is, is anybody enjoying time with their families anymore? <laughs> Have we crossed that threshold where it's like, let me do anything other than spend time with my family? That's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was going to say, I've gotten really good at uh, telling people how a rainbow works because I've been studying all the uh, kindergarten curriculum. Yes. <laughs> Any questions? Fire them off right now. There we go. Nope. Uh, thank you. Can you see these streams? Um, let me see. No, just fire them at me. Okay. No, there's just a thank you so far. Oh, awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you for taking the time. More thank yous. Oh, wait. Hold on. I can't see the rest of this. Uh, came across you from a LaxCon talk. Can you show the heart again? Oh, yeah. Totally. Great question. So, okay, so um, Dave Madeira, if you're still on, will you, uh, will you chime in and let us know? Because I, I, if you don't mind, KB, I've got a story I've got to tell for, uh, for Dave Madeira if he's on. All right, where's the heart? All right, so it's almost there. Okay, there you go. And again, I, you know, I, I said this earlier, but I, but I, I really think if you have practice, you know, when I, when I do one-on-one -on -one drills with, uh, with, with, with teams, I typically put cones down in this formation, just as, you know, just so we have an awareness of where we're trying to get offensively and where we're trying to prevent guys from getting defensively. It makes that one-on-one -on -one a lot more realistic when you have the sort of molten hot magma in the middle of the field that the young players can't run into. Did Dave chime in? Is he still there? I haven't okay. seen him. Uh, there you go. Do you have a particular strategy for substitutions or a way to practice them? Wow. Um, so let me ask, let me ask a question back. Are you talking, are you talking like triangle substitutions here where we're trying to get guys off over the midline, stuff like that, high level substitutions or just getting guys on the field? 
give him a chance to answer. Let's see. Nope. Uh, getting guys on the field. Just getting guys on the field. So, you know, I, I think when, when I'm – it was funny watching the, the first thing we noticed when we were watching that 99 clip was the horns. It's so funny to watch a game where there are horns and you have guys running on and off the field and slow things down so much. Um, I think, I think when you're just trying to get guys on the field, um, the, the, the best time to get guys on the field is on the offensive end. Right. So, so you want to typically have your mindset as a midi B if I go in on offense, it's, it's offense, defense out. Okay, so, so if we're getting guys in on the offensive end, that means we get the ball down, and, and I don't know what level you are and whether you're capable of, you know, your team's capable of throwing three consecutive passes. My high school team was occasionally capable of doing that. So depending on who we were playing, if we were playing a really good defensive team, sometimes I would have a guy just hold it while we were subbing. Sometimes I would have them move the ball, and we would try to get guys off. Um, but typically you want to bring guys in on offense and you try to get them off one-on-one -on -one while your attack is holding the ball. And then those guys, if you're playing both ways, those guys are responsible for then getting back on defense. And they've got, so they've got to play an offensive shift, a defensive shift and out. So offense, defense out. And then if you, if you, if you want, and you want to get crazy, you can start to triangle substitutions. It seems really difficult and people sort of, get antsy about it because, because they're like, I can barely get my kids to walk in a straight line. But all you really have to do is you have to get that near side defenseman in the habit of just running to the box, right? And what that means is, so he just runs to the box every time and then you can run your middies on and get them to the middle of the field so your guys just cross back the midline rather than running all the way to the box. Now, that also relies on your offense being able to throw a couple of passes, but I would say typically just go, just get the guys off on an offensive shift. And you can do, you know, if you have, if you have, and I know, you know, we're not supposed to, to talk necessarily about how we want to stagger our good players and our bad players, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a guy that's sort of your workhorse, he's a guy that, you know, you might leave on a little bit longer and you might, rather than subbing a whole line, you may sub two guys and leave him on. It's up to you working that way. But if you're going three at a time, I would say do it on the offensive end while you're either holding it or moving the ball around. Awesome. Do you want to put up your, your last slide there? I know what it is. <laughs> yeah. So, so just, and you guys probably heard this with Mitch and Ryan, but um, just so you guys know some additional opportunities um, we're going to be doing summer camps uh, closer, closer to your neck of the woods. We've been doing them out, out, out West here for the last few years at UMass and at Amherst and at Deerfield Academy. But this year we're going to be doing um, getting there. We're going to be doing our overnight camps, our, our basic uh, New England sleepaway camp. That's going to be at Bryant. We've got a great relationship with Coach Pressler there. It's a phenomenal facility, and um, he, really, he really is just terrific sharing it and making sure kids get on the best field, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to be directing one of my favorite camps that we do is our Future Aces New England. And this is a camp that's, you know, for, for kids in this five to eight, you know, age group, fifth to eighth grade. And it's really tailored for kids who have aspirations to play college lacrosse. And we hit on the recruiting process. We have the coaches who are there talk about their sort of personal journeys in the, uh, in the recruiting world. I remember one of, the most, one of the most powerful sort of personal journey conversations we had was a couple years ago before the NCAA changed the recruiting rules. We had a kid who um, was a player at Carolina talk about being a freshman and uh, legitimately having panic attacks because he had D1 college coaches that were pressuring him to make a decision and, you know, basically trying to bully him into coming to their schools. And it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to hear um, high level college and professional players talk about how they made their decision to go to the colleges that they went to and what their recruiting process looked like versus what your recruiting process looks like, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a camp that I'm directing and that's going to be at St. Mark's. Awesome. Well, for, for everyone watching, um, if you, if you miss any of the ones from earlier in this week, they're up on our YouTube page, the Mass Bay Youth Lacrosse League, our YouTube page. Um, they post that link also on our social media pages to it. So you can check those out. I'll put this one on um, probably later tonight as well. And uh, I really just want to thank the, the trilogy guys. I was, you know, sitting, I could listen to Streep's talk all night about this stuff and thinking about how lucky uh, 
the last three nights, I spent three and a half, four hours listening to Mitch Blyle talk about defense, Ryan Boyle explain attack, and now uh, Matt Striebel going through the midfield, and uh, it's pretty cool. So <laughs> I've loved it. Um, I, you know, got great feedback. You guys are awesome for taking the time to do this uh, for Mass Bay and for many of the other coaches that have joined us. So I want to thank you again, Strebs, for that for the time. And uh, someone someone commented on the uh, the great animation stepping up the game from the whiteboard. But the other guys I, are. Using I tell you so. what, there's there's no better way to kill a quarantine than to do uh, tiny little animations on PowerPoint. It's like <laughs> it's weirdly meditative. It it took my mind off all the all the craziness. It was uh, it, it was fun to do. So yeah, great. Well, thank you. We look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you up here this summer um, out our way. And uh, thank everyone for joining us. And uh, we do have a couple more tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Marty Bose is going to do, uh, he's calling his advanced wall ball. Not exactly sure, but looking forward to it. And then uh, a peak goalie is doing a goalie session. Um, and then I think it's actually Mitch. I'm not sure who's in trilogy. Someone's doing uh, for beginner, beginner coaches uh, tomorrow night. So. We still have a few more to go and looking to announce some more for next week as well. So thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see everyone out in the field soon. Awesome. Thanks, KB. Thanks, Matt.